Well, good morning, everyone. We're going to get started so that we have plenty of time to cover everything that we want to get in this morning. Um, just a, another brief housekeeping note. <laughs> uh, I mentioned a week or two ago that we only had like three classes left, and Eddie pointed out to me, wait a minute, there's four classes left. Well, I'm going to be out of town on the last Sunday of this month. So we have today and next Sunday to complete our parable study. And then Dan Byers is gonna pick up with his Ephesians study on the last Sunday of this month, because we're gonna be taking the kids to the Indiana camp that day. So we're gonna be out of town. Uh, but I've really enjoyed this so far. I've enjoyed studying this so far. I've never delved this deeply into the parables before. And so I hope that you're getting something out of this. I hope that what we're saying is making sense and maybe that we're getting a little bit of kind of overview um, of what Jesus is trying to do by teaching in parables so that as we get into the specific parables, or I should say, as you get into the specific parables and dig down deep into what, what they are, what they mean, what Jesus is saying, that you have kind of a, a knowledge base to to jump in that study from. And I'm guessing, David, was this you? Is this your choice or is this Dempsey's choice? Okay, so today's bulletin is a, an, an article by Brother Earnhardt that I'm assuming probably comes from his book because that book is just a series of essays um, about the prodigal son. And so this will be one of the parables that we're gonna talk about this morning. Um, Probably not as heavily as most would in a parable study, uh, but we, we just don't have time. We could talk about the prodigal son for a week straight, uh, as I'm sure probably everybody, everybody would agree, uh, but we just don't have time for it. But we're, we're going to see today, hopefully, a picture of what Jesus is trying to do. So in our last set of parables... <clears throat> Remember, we're, we've divided this up into three main groups that we're talking about. And so in our last set of parables, which were concentrated pretty heavily in Matthew 13, that's where the lion's share of them are, we have what we were calling the kingdom parables. And these parables are focused on, really, when it boils down to it, they're focused on the seed. You know, that's kind of one of the images that Jesus uses over and over again, especially in those kingdom parables. Um, and so they're focused on the seed, which is the gospel. It's the gospel message. It's what's being planted to make the vine grow. And you can term the vine the church. You can term the vine an individual Christian that bears fruit. However you want to do that, all of it stems from a single source, and that is the seed that's being planted. And so when we get to this next section, what we're going to focus on is basically how this seed is going to grow. Now, we already said last time, God is the power by which this seed grows. It's the power by which the growth itself happens. But what we also mentioned last time is we are workers in the vineyard. It's our job to help tend to the vineyard as we're growing as well. And so what does that look like? What does it look like to be a good worker in the vineyard of the Lord? Remember, you go all the way back to Genesis. What was Adam's job in the garden? It was to tend it and it was to keep it or to guard it, right? So he's supposed to be the manager of what God has created. Well, we as workers in the kingdom are supposed to do the same thing. So how can we be sure that what we're doing, what we're teaching, how we're acting, how we are imitating God's glory, because that's how we were made, right? We were made in the image of God. And the whole purpose of be fruitful and multiply was to make more of God's image on earth. So how can we be sure that we're doing that? Now, Kevin's study in 1 John really talks about that a lot. Love is so key, is so key. And many of the things that we're going to talk about stem from love, having a love for God 
and having a love for others. And of course, you can remember there's a parable in which that comes up very prominently. Um, but you think about this last set of parables, you know, especially kind of the main, I guess, the, the watershed parable of parables, right? The parable of the soil. We've, we've referenced it many times, and I think appropriately. If you think through the gospel story, think through the story of Jesus, just, just the story itself. Do you see all the soils present in that narrative in some form or fashion? Give me some examples. What, I mean, let's just, let's just go for the, you know, the layup here. How about the hard soil? Where do we see examples of the hard soil in the gospel? We're going to be more interactive this morning. So just, just fair warning. Where, where do we see examples of that hard soil, that hard soil that doesn't receive the word and is packed down and hard hearted? Scribes and the Pharisees, is that what you're going to say, Mary? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I'm sure that's what you were going to say. Okay. I would put him in a different category. <laughs> I like where you're at, though. You're thinking this morning. I like that. So, yeah, I mean, the, the scribes and the Pharisees are the first thing that comes to mind for me. I mean, here we have a group of people who should have some knowledge, and, and really, honestly, they have the best knowledge base, if you're really thinking about it, of Scripture. And yet, when Jesus comes and he starts spreading that seed, and he has dis disciples spreading the seed, the gospel message, they have no interest in hearing it. And so they are the living embodiment of the prophecies from the Old Testament. They have stopped up their ears. They have become hard. Um, they are just as hard-hearted as Pharaoh is. Now, if you were to tell them that, what would that reaction be? Oh, no, 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 no. Pharaoh was the bad guy. We know the secrets to the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus says, no, no, you don't. No. So yeah, we got that hard soil. How about the how about that rocky soil? Can you think of any examples of maybe somebody that did receive the word, but then something hard came along, something difficult, either a hard time or a hard teaching, and then they just kind of faded away. Go ahead. John Smith says where Jesus was telling people, I am bread. Okay. Okay. Maybe you were going to say the exact same thing. <laughs> we're all in the same wavelength. Yeah. So what Eddie was saying is John chapter six. So if you remember when Jesus starts talking about, I'm the bread of life and whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood. And, you know, the people are thinking, what's with this flesh and blood stuff? Like, are we cannibals or something? This is way too hard. I'm out. I, I just came for the bread. I, I heard something about bread and fish. And so I'm, I, you know, the handout's gone. So now we're, we're getting into something that I don't understand and I'm out. I would, I would consider that to be the rocky soil. These are people that initially followed Jesus. They heralded him as the king. Uh, they, they recognized him for the most part for, for what he was. But when he came teaching something, that they didn't understand or was too hard to comprehend, they went away. They were gone. Okay, how about that thorny soil? Mary, give me your first example again. It's the man who wanted to know what he needed to do to inherit the kingdom. And also, how about the, the rich, uh, the, the, uh, the young rich man who had great riches? I mean, here's, oh, is that, that's who you're talking about, okay. Uh, we've got somebody here that wants to know. They're, they're coming to the source and saying, I want to know, what do, what, what do I got to do? What, what is it? And so Jesus says at the end of all of that conversation, what does he tell him? What's the, what's the ultimate part he gets to? What's that? Give it all up. Sell it all. Sell it all. 
the thorny soil. Yes. Uh huh. Uh, maybe. I don't know their initial reaction to the gospel, so I'm going <laughs> to. Yes. Well, there, there's, there's something outside that's taking their attention away and suffocating. So Judas. Okay, sure. Judas was one of the 12 that was initially sent out. And we read in the scriptures that all 12 of them went out. So Judas is one of those. He wasn't, he wasn't, you know, kind of on the negative side of things from the very beginning. But we also see that even as before Judas betrays Jesus, he's he's skimming off the money bag. He wants, you know, he, he he's in it for the money. And so he gets choked out. That's right. So all great examples. And money plays a big part in that. But aren't there other things that can take us away? Aren't there other thorns that can take us away? So, so when we look at Scripture, both in the Gospels and math, math that's a great example that even, even much afterwards, I mean, definitely many of the epistles to the churches are about not focusing on worldly things because these worldly things will take away what has been given to you. So that's, that's a great example. But we're seeing these soils in the narrative, right? So, so this next set of parables, to get to what we're talking about, what we're going to call the grace or evangelism parables, they're going to focus on the upside-down nature of the gospel message and how it's superior and subversive. That's one of those academic words, right? Superior and subversive. That means it kind of gets underneath it and, and turns it on its head. It is superior and subversive to the preconceived notions of what the Messiah and his kingdom would be. What did they think the Messiah was going to be? What was their image? An earthly king, but not just an earthly king, but an earthly king that did what? Conquered. Yeah, a conqueror. He's going to come charging in with his royal diadem glowing on his white steed and lead them to victory. And they were going to be number one. Well, when Jesus comes along, they didn't quite get what they bargained for. And so all their preconceived notions kind of go out the window. You know, we've said it before. This is a king and a kingdom like no other. We talked a few classes ago about kind of the upside down nature of how Jesus himself came onto the picture. And then what he does once he gets here. But Jesus is going to turn these earthly kingdom values on their head to show what God truly values. And we've already seen in the Sermon on the Mount how he does that. You've heard it said this, but I say this. This, this is what's really the, the meat of what God was trying to get to with whatever you read in the law. And so kind of to bring this back into the gardening imagery then, the parables we're going to talk about today are the implements in the hands of the master gardener to work these three bad soils. We said it on Wednesday. Can these soils change? The hard soil, the rocky soil, the thorny soil, can they change into good soil? Yeah, they can. You need somebody to get the weeds out. You need somebody to break up the rock shelf underneath. You need somebody to unpack the path on the top. But they can be broken up. It's going to take blood, sweat, and tears to do it, but they can be. These parables are the tools in the hand of the gardener that's going to do that. It's going to hurt, though, in many cases. And so as he does that, really, what he's doing, he's showing his disciples how to tend and keep the fields until harvest. He's showing them how to be the workers. And so if you turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 10, this is where we're going to pick up this morning. We're going to be predominantly in Luke's account this morning. We were in Matthew last time. We're going to be in Luke this time because this is where the majority of this section of parables is found. Now, Luke's chronology is a little bit different than, for instance, Matthew or Mark's. Some of the parables that he gives might fall into other sections in those gospels. But again, we're, we're painting a picture here. We're putting together pieces. And I think Luke really does that well. 
Uh, and, and I think you'll agree with some of the ones that we'll hit this morning. So in Luke chapter 10, just before we have this kind of main thrust of parables, this is where Jesus is sending out the 70. Now, he's already sent out the 12, and they've come back, and they're very excited about, about their work and what they're doing. Um, and then, you know, as they are, um, as they're following Jesus, as they're continuing to teach, as they have stuck around after the feeding of the 5,000, when pretty much everybody else hit the bricks, now they're thinking, we're, we're pretty good here. We're, we're sticking with you, Lord. So, so what are we going to get out of this arrangement? Like, where, where do we sit? Because, because we're sticking with you. We're, we're with you, Lord. And so in Luke chapter 9, we see that even as early as this part, they're saying an argument started among them about who would be the greatest of them. But Jesus, knowing the thoughts of their hearts, took a little child and had him stand next to him and says, whoever welcomes this little child in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me welcomes him who sent me. Or whoever is least among you, this one is great. And that is the main underline of this section of parables. Whoever is least among you, this one is great. And so then we get to Luke chapter 10 when the 70 are sent out. And they come back and they're so excited. They're so excited. We have, we have power over demons and we're healing sicknesses and, and we're just doing all kinds of good work. Well, at the very beginning of him sending those workers out, look at what he says. First of all, what he says, he starts with prayer. That's one of his main points of emphasis here. In Luke chapter 10, let's just pick up at verse 1. After this, the Lord appointed 70 others, and he sent them ahead of him in pairs to every town and a place where he himself was about to go. And he told them, the harvest is abundant, but the workers are few. Therefore, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. Now go. I'm sending you out like lambs among wolves. Don't carry a money bag, a traveling bag, or sandals. Don't greet anyone along the road. Whatever house you enter, first say peace to this household. If a son of peace is there, your peace will rest on him. But if not, it will return to you. Remain in the same house, eating and drinking what they offer, for the worker is worthy of his wages, and so on and so forth. But the, the main part of this, he's going right back to that harvest imagery, right? I mean, gardening, it, it's, it's a big thing in the Bible. We, it, we begin the Bible with a garden, we end it with a garden. So it makes sense that this is one of the main images that Jesus will use. But what he says here is, the harvest is abundant, but the workers are few. Pray to the Lord to send out workers into his harvest. Okay, well, when, when we pray for something like this, when we say, Lord, move that mountain, what's the next expectation? Who's going to be the tool that moves the mountain? He hands me a shovel and says, okay, here you go. So when Jesus says, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out workers, who's he talking about? He's talking about them. He's talking about them. And they're going to make more workers. And really, the message of the workers, if you think about it, is the same as that of John the Baptist and of Jesus himself. If you look at verse 11 there, we are wiping, uh, look at the latter part of that verse, know this for certain, the kingdom of God has come near. This is their message. That was Jesus' message. That was John the Baptist's message. Pay attention. The kingdom of heaven has come near. And the response to that message, the response to the kingdom announcement is going to serve as a litmus test to determine who's going to be a part of the kingdom and who's not. So then in verse 16, he says, whoever listens, akuo or shema, same word, whoever listens to you, listens to me. Whoever rejects you, rejects me. And whoever rejects me, rejects the one who sent me. And so then for those that do hear shema and believe, go, Jesus goes on to say that they are blessed and that there are many in the past who wanted to see these things. And, and we know from, from latter writings, even angels desire to look into these things. But what is it that they are seeing and hearing? 
What is it that people that desired, that would have desired to have seen these things, what is it that they're seeing and hearing? It's the realization. It's the substance of the prophetic word. And now what we're seeing here is what does that realization look like? So, so back up to chapter 9 for just a second. Chapter 9, verses 23 through 26. This is the backwards nature of the kingdom, the upside down nature of the kingdom. Luke chapter 9, verse 23. If anyone wants to come to me or come with me, he must do what? He must deny himself. He must take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life because of me will save it. What is a man benefited if he gains the whole world yet loses his own soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory, and that of the Father and of the holy angels. The upside-down message of the kingdom, the Christian wins by losing. Take this the right way when I say it. We are losers. We don't like to be told that. You go out on a sports field and you start calling people losers or somebody calls you a loser. You might have a negative reaction. We win by losing. And, and really, maybe I should even go a little bit further. We win by giving up. We win by giving up what is not truly of importance. And so really, when it boils down to it, Humility and service, giving up myself for someone else, are at the core of the gospel message. What does Philippians 2 say about humility? Philippians 2, when it's talking about Jesus, what does it say about humility? How does he describe humility? Okay, the son came down among us and humbled himself. He gives up his position at the side of the Father for a time, that in itself is unfathomable. He gives it up, and when he comes, he not only abases himself by putting himself among us, the, the stinky, the, the, the mistake-prone, the self-gratuitous, uh, uh, self he puts himself among the lowest of us. But what's the result? Philippians chapter 2 and verse 9. For this reason, what? God exalted him. And so in losing, Jesus won. And we know the ultimate expression of that is he lost on the cross. And then he is resurrected. And that's the... I mean, that, that's the climax of Peter's sermon in Acts chapter 2. So, that's blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Every time he gets this, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Everyone's like, what does it mean to be meek? And what does it mean to be blessed? I mean, it's what you just said. I mean, to be meek is to be lowly like Jesus, is lowly, and blessing is, you know, the, the, the receiving of the kingdom. Mm -hmm. It's that, you know, you're teaching that verse. And, and you've just given basically all of the parables in this section, in, in that one summary. Um, so yeah, the, the blessed is the meek. It's somebody that willingly places themselves below others, just as Jesus did. And Jesus himself said, Mark 10, 45, I came not to be served, but to serve. And his entire life is service. And so then, if he came to do that, and he's the master teacher, the master gardener, what do his workers look like? The same thing. Nate, you had a comment. Uh, obviously, a lot of the things that you said that were in fact aggravated, desert or aggression. Yeah. Like, when he says there in chapter 9, uh, when we just come up to me and I'm taking this broth daily, I think they really understood that mm -hmm. that point, like what taking up their, their cross. Right. I don't think they did either because they didn't believe that Jesus was literally going to take up his cross, right? So, yeah, I don't think it hit home. No, I, th I think that's exactly right. 
But you're right, after he dies, they now have a very real and very visceral image of this concept coming into play. And so then kingdom servants, kingdom workers, vineyard workers, they should look like their master. And, and Jesus emphasizes that Mark 9, 35 through 37, Luke chapter 9, 57 through 62. He talks about how they should look like him. Now, in the parts of the gospel narrative, to get to the thrust of what we're, thrust of what we're talking about this morning with 20 minutes left, in the parts of the gospel narrative that we're currently looking at, we can see obstacles to this work, can't we? We can see the thorns. We can see it in both the religious elite. We can see how their traditions have blinded them. We can see their disbelief. We can see their hypocrisy, greed. They're judgmental. They're power hungry. They're self-righteous. After Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, what was their response? We got to get rid of this guy because our position is going to be taken away. You got a guy raised from the dead after three days. We got to get rid of this guy because he, he's a threat to our position. But lest we only put this on the Pharisees, did you know that many of the parables were not the result of the Pharisees' problems? Whose problems were they the result of? Or who was Jesus clarifying for? It was his disciples. We just read just a second ago, they're already arguing, who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And I'm sure Jesus is like, guys, honestly, do you get what I'm trying to do here? Have you seen what's been going on so far? And I mean, even among the disciples, we see nationalism, misplaced zeal. We see power plays. We see misplaced priorities. We see short-sightedness about, about what Jesus' uh, mission was. So lest we think that Jesus is only giving these parables just to the Pharisees and to the, the, you know, to the religious elite and, and the hypocrites, he's talking to his own people too because they've got to understand. Now, luckily, we see that, that many of them do later on in their message, but I think in the shadow of the cross is really when they start to get the main thrust of that. And so as a result of these issues then that we see, we, the audience now, kind of as outside observers, we are presented with a series of confrontations and conversations. There's a sermon title for you. Confrontations and conversations that prompt many of these parables in the middle section. So again, our focus is going to be on Luke's account, and we're going to go through these very briefly. But I want you to see from each of these parables what the main thrust is and how we're building a picture of what a kingdom worker is under the supervision of the Father. Okay, so the first parable that we come to is one that we're very familiar with, Luke chapter 10, parable of the Good Samaritan. What is the, and again, I'm going to need to be interactive, and we're going to have to do it in a timely manner. So what is the occasion that prompted this parable? Luke chapter 10, verse 25. Okay, so we've got a lawyer, an expert in the law, yours might say. This guy knows it backwards and forwards, has probably copied it himself many times. This guy knows the law. He knows every jot. He knows every dot. And he comes to Jesus. And he says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Which in itself is an interesting question that we don't really have time to go into right now. But somebody give me the, just the, the general gist of the good Samar parable, parable of the Good Samaritan. I mean, just quick one-sentence synopsis. It seems that the story told in different upstanding citizens are, are mentioning that we should be doing the right thing, but don't see someone who this group of people would find the Bible, would find the unsavory of Samaria, who actually does the right thing, takes care of it. Mm -hmm. And so, by contrasting the highest, the people of highest honor in society against this man, mm -hmm. we get the sense, we get the importance that good work is more important than the statue. Okay, yeah, so, so we see the contrasting images here. Here is a guy 
that knows the law and we presume it keeps it, you know, to, it, to its nth letter. That's great. That's great. Now, he says a priest and a Levite come by. And as Matt said, these, these guys are supposed to be the upstanding citizens in the kingdom. They're the ones that people look to. As a matter of fact, the priests, if we're going to use this garden imagery, the priests are tasked with the same thing that Adam is as far as the law goes. They are to keep it and attend to it. And they keep and tend the people as well as, as, as people that explain the law and people that, that help um, arbitrate problems and, and represent them to God and all those types of things. A priest passes by this, this hurt man, this man that has fallen among robbers. A Levite passes by, but a Samaritan. And, and we think about Samaria, you know, we wonder, like, why, why are they so bad? Well, first of all, they're half-breeds, which we knew that, you know, the Jews are not, they're not too keen on. But they're not only half-breeds, they're half-breeds who were kind of perceived as corrupting the scriptures. Remember when Jesus talks to the Samaritan woman at the well? She says, your people say this, but our people say this. And so then you had this kind of conflicting view of things sometimes. And so they are a corrupted version. Here's a guy that's an expert in the law. He is pure as far as the law is concerned, as far as his view of the law is concerned. Here is a corrupt version. And the corrupt version is lifted up above the upstanding citizens, as Matt so aptly put it. Okay, so we already see this upside down nature of the kingdom. Kingdom humility and kingdom compassion redefine the heart of the law. Remember when Jesus healed on the Sabbath? What was the reaction? First of all, you're breaking the law. And then Jesus says, well, which one of you, if his neighbor was having an issue with a, an animal or something like that on the Sabbath, would not help him pull it out? Hmm. Okay. All right. So, so we've got that one part of the character, kingdom, humility, and compassion. I told you we're going to breeze through these very quickly. So the rich fool then, Luke chapter 12, we're just going, in the, with, going to these in order. Luke chapter 12, the rich fool. Somebody give me the context according to Luke chapter 12 and verse 1. Or I'm sorry, uh, Luke chapter 12 and verse 13. Okay, yeah, so Jesus is being, he, he's surrounded by crowds, he's teaching among crowds, and these two brothers come up, and they're fighting with each other about, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Now, these guys sound bad to us, but isn't this what James and John do later on? <laughs> Someone from the crowd said to him, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. So, so what's the problem here? What's the focus on? focuses on material wealth. What give, give, make sure I get what's mine. Okay. And so he teaches this parable of the rich fool. He, he says, verse 15, watch out and be on guard against all greed because one's life is not in the abundance of his possessions. And then he talks about this parable about a rich man who's who said, you know, what should I do since I don't have anywhere to store my crops? I'm going to build big barns and I'm going to fill them. And then I'm going to build bigger barns and fill them. And I mean, you know, in our kind of modern term, I'm going to build my stock portfolio and then I'm going to divide those and I'm going to build both of those. And it's all about making the money. Well, what did Solomon say about making all that money and getting all that stuff? Vanity. And he says at the very end of this parable, fool, your life is your soul is required of you. All of this stuff that you concentrated on in your life is not important. And so Jesus really spotlights misplaced priorities. But wouldn't that be kind of the focus of an earthly kingdom? Make yourself bigger, get more things. That's what Rome was doing, wasn't it? Annex more land, get more people, make my armies bigger. But in the end, Rome fell, just like any of the other empires, just like our country will one day do, as all do. Okay? So... Jesus spotlights the misplaced priorities. The kingdom is not about earthly wealth. We've already seen Jesus say, 
Store up treasures for yourself in heaven where things cannot corrupt or destroy or steal. Okay, so move forward then. Luke chapter 13, the parable, parable of the barren fig tree. Now, this is not the same instance as when Jesus is entering Jerusalem and he, he curses the fig tree because it's barren. I think that is part two to this parable. But you remember how we looked at Isaiah chapter five and the Lord came upon, you know, the Lord prepared this vineyard and the vineyard was barren. It, it put forth stinky grapes. It was, it was useless. And what was the end result of that, that vineyard in that, in that image? What was the end result? He got rid of it. It wasn't any good. So what should I do? What's the reasonable thing to do? Get rid of it. Here, we have a parable about a fig tree, and the master comes along, and there's nothing on it. And so he says then, uh, the, the vineyard worker says, you know, for three years, I've come looking for fruit on this fig tree and haven't found any. Do you, you, do you want me to cut it down? We could be using this soil. That's exactly what happens in Isaiah chapter five. We could be using this soil for something else. Cut it down. Why should we even waste the soil? Verse eight, though, what the master says, but he replied to him, sir, leave it this year also until I dig around it and fertilize it. Perhaps it will bear fruit next year. But if not, you can cut it down. Now, isn't that exactly what we're talking about with the soils being tended, how the soil can change? Here is a fig tree that's not putting anything out. And he says, leave it for one more year. Let it stay. Let's see what it does. That's long suffering. That's what God did with Israel throughout the entire Old Testament. That's why he sent them the prophets. They were the fertilizers of the soil and the tenders of the garden, but they refused. And so, again, I think the part two of this parable is when Jesus comes along the barren fig tree outside Jerusalem and curses it and says, may nothing ever come from you again, because he's Jerus it's, the, it's the image of Jerusalem. I came to you. I tended to you. I fertilized you. And what happened? You're about to kill me. So... You're going to have to go. And we know that that eventually happens uh, through the Romans. So he gives opportunity for the unfruitful, but only for so long. And that's going to be a key part of that last set of parables that we're going to get to. Okay, so move ahead then. Luke chapter 14, the parable of the large banquet. Now, the next couple of parables are kind of a string that, that I think Luke intentionally puts all these together. It's maybe that Jesus taught them in proximity to each other, but it's very interesting that Luke strings all of these together in Luke 14, 15, and 16. So one of the first ones that we look at then, the parable of the large banquet. If you look in Luke chapter 14 and verse, um, uh, verse 12, he's sitting there eating with some Pharisees, and he noticed, or, or eating with some people, we presume, yeah, it, I believe it is some of the leading Pharisees. And he says to them, when you give a lunch or a dinner, when you have a banquet, don't invite your friends or your brothers, your relatives or rich neighbors, because they might invite you back and you would be repaid. It's, it's a tit for tat uh, relationship, okay? It's a, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. There's no focus on the vertical though. It's all horizontal. And so what he says in verse 13, on the contrary, when you host a banquet, and banquets are lavish spreads, okay? This isn't just an everyday meal where you sit down and have a sandwich. This is the full Monty, okay? So on the contrary, when you host a banquet, invite those who are poor, maimed, lame, or blind. So that's the direct command that he's giving them. Then he tells this parable. And he says, a man was giving a large banquet, invited many, and at the time of the banquet, he sent his slave to tell... Uh, to tell those who were invited, come because everything is now ready. All things are ready. Come to the feast. That's where that song comes from. What happens? I got things to do. Sorry. I got to go check this cow out. Um, you know, I got I to gotta go have a picnic with my new wife. Uh, I got things to do. Sorry. And so the servants come back. Master, they don't want to come. Um, and so then he says the very same thing that he just commanded them to do. Go out quickly into the streets and alleys and bring here the poor, the maimed, the blind, and the lame. Okay? 
So, so we've turned this on their head. The king deserves to be made our priority. We don't give excuses when he invites us. We come to the feast. And we do that because of the next set of parables, the lost sheep, coin, and uh, son. And there are some who think that this is all one parable. I'm, I'm indifferent on that, but the message is the same. We make the king our priority because he has made us his priority. And that's the focus of Luke. That's, that's Luke chapter 15 in a nutshell. He has made us his priority. He stops everything to look for the one sheep and leaves the 99. He stops everything to find a coin that he knows is in the house and he looks for it. He stops everything every day to go out on the front porch and look for that son to come home. He has made us his priority. We are important to him. Yeah. Right. Right. And what was the event that spawned Luke chapter 15? What, what happened? Okay, in Luke chapter 14, we just saw him eating a, at a large meal with a bunch of Pharisees and religious leaders. And so then he turns around a couple of hours later and goes into a home of maybe a tax collector or, you know, a Samaritan or something like that. And they say, well, well, well hold on now. You were just with all the good people. Why are you going to eating with the bad people? Well, the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. And that's what Luke 15 is all about. He has made us his priority, and we do not have, we have even much less time than I'd hoped to, to get into that. Um, this is one that's very confusing to many of us. I, I think this is probably the most controversial of Jesus' parables, the parable of the dishonest manager. But really, when it comes down to it, this parable, without getting into the weeds of it, is our, uh, our resources are really God's resources. That, that's what it comes down to. How are we steward, stewarding them? How are we using them? They should be used as wisely as possible for his kingdom. Now, Jesus gives an example of a man who misused what was given to him and what was left for him to tend to. And he, he does what he can when he's caught with it. He's still fired in the end, but he does what he can. And Jesus says, look, you're not even doing what he did. So let's, let's kind of pick up the work here. That, that's kind of the main thrust of the dishonest manager. Be a good tender of what God has given you for his purposes. And, and do it a lot better than the world that you're denouncing against. The rich man and Lazarus, Luke chapter 16. Okay, we, we kind of know this story. We have a, a rich man and we have Lazarus that's sitting outside his gate and he ignores him throughout all his life. Lazarus ends up in paradise. The rich man ends up in Hades and in torment. And so we see that their positions shift. That's, that's, the, whole, that's the whole thrust of that parable. People are of more value than possessions. The rich man was very pleased with what he had, and so he ignored people. Lazarus was, was despised. He was afflicted. He had sores. So he's very much like Jesus in that image. The humble will one day sit in places of honor. So just like Jesus, Lazarus was elevated from his humility. The persistent widow. We know this is a widow, uh, uh, a woman that was going before an unrighteous judge. And because of her persistence in, 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 in treating him and uh, kind of asking for what she needed, he eventually gives in. And he says, if an unrighteous judge was willing to do this, how much more so is your father willing to give you what you want? But you've got to be persistent in prayer. Don't get discouraged if you're not seeing immediate results. Okay, just keep putting your petitions out there. And in his good time, in his time, in his time, he makes all things beautiful in his time. That's what he's going to do. So be persistent. And then the Pharisee and the tax collector, Luke, Luke chapter 18. You have a, a, tax, a, a Pharisee that goes to the temple and he's visibly beating his breast. Lord, I thank you that I'm not like this tax collector over here that's so awful and bad. And the tax collector comes in and he says he wouldn't even look up into heaven, 
Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. And we see the contrasting image there between someone who is, I think Matt used a great image there, an upstanding citizen and somebody who is despised and yet is an example of righteousness. Humility is the doorway to righteousness. And then the very last one, which may also fall into kind of the judgment parables, but I think also can, is applicable here. The 10 minus, or in Matthew's account, it's the, it's the parable of the talents, right? We have people that are given stewardship over varying levels of, of, uh, of monetary value, and they're supposed to do something with it. And so then the goal of our work is to be fruitful. You plant a plant in a garden and it doesn't bear any fruit, it doesn't do any good. So, so why keep it? So the goal of our work is to be fruitful. Inactivity is as bad as opposition. I'm going to leave you with that one. <laughs> but all of these show the grace of the Father. How this isn't just about you broke the rules, therefore you're out. This is about how the Father wants us so desperately, but we've got to humble ourselves. We've got to put ourselves under the dirt so that we can come out in the image of the Father. Okay? So we're going to leave that there this morning, and we will pick up with the parables of judgment next time and, and wrap this study up. Thank you for your participation this morning.